Chapter 6, The Standard of Personality We have now got some general idea as to the place of the personal factor in the creative order. And so the next question is, how does this affect ourselves? The answer is that if we have grasped the fundamental fact that the moving power in the creative process is the self-contemplation of spirit, and if we also see that because we are miniature reproductions of the original spirit, our contemplation of it becomes its contemplation of itself from the standpoint of our own individuality. If we have grasped these fundamental conceptions, then it follows that our process for developing power is to contemplate the originating spirit as the source of power we want to develop. And here we must guard against a mistake which people often make when looking to the spirit as the source of power. We are apt to regard it as sometimes giving and sometimes withholding power, and consequently are never sure which way it will act. But by doing so, we make spirit contemplate itself as having no definite action at all as a plus and minus which mutually cancel each other, and therefore by the law of creative process no result is to be expected. This mistake consists in regarding the power as something separate from the spirit, whereas by the analysis of the creative process which we have now made, we see that the spirit itself is the power, because the power comes into existence only through spirit's self-contemplation, then the logical inference from this is that by contemplating the spirit as the power, and vice versa, by contemplating the power as the spirit, a similar power is being generated in ourselves. Again, an important conclusion follows from this, which is that to generate any particular sort of power, we should contemplate it in the abstract rather than as applied to the particular set of circumstances we have in hand. The circumstances indicate the sort of power we want, but they do not help us to generate it. Rather, they impress us with a sense of something contrary to the power, something which has to be overcome by it, and therefore we should endeavor to dwell on the power in itself, and so come into touch with its limitless infinitude. It is here that we begin to find the benefit of a divine standard of human individuality. That also is an infinite principle, and by identifying ourselves with it, we bring to bear upon the abstract conception of infinite impersonal power, a corresponding conception of infinite personality, so that we thus import the personal factor which is able to use the power without imposing any strain upon ourselves. We know that by the very nature of the creative process, we are the one with the originating spirit, and therefore one with all the principles of its being, and consequently one with its infinite personality. And therefore our contemplation of it as the power which we want gives us the power to use the power. This is the self-contemplation of spirit employed from the individual standpoint for the generating of power. Then comes the application of the power thus generated. But there is only one creative process, that of the self-contemplation of spirit, and therefore the way to use this process for the application of the power is to contemplate ourselves as surrounded by the conditions which we want to produce. This does not mean that we are to lay down a hard and fast pattern of the conditions and strenuously endeavor to compel the power to conform its working to every detail of our mental picture. To do so would be to hinder its working and to exhaust ourselves. What we are to dwell upon is the idea of an infinite power producing the happiness we desire. And because this power is also the forming power of the universe, trusting it to give form, to the conditions which will most perfectly react upon us to produce the particular state of consciousness desired. Thus neither on the side of indrawing nor of outgiving is there any constraining of the power. While in both cases there is initiative and selective action on the part of the individual, for the generating of power he takes the initiative of invoking it by contemplation 
and he makes selection of the sort of power to invoke. While on the giving outside, he makes selection of the purpose for which the power is to be employed, and takes the initiative by his thoughts of directing the power to that purpose. He thus fulfills the fundamental requirements of the creative process by exercising spirit's inherent faculties of initiative and selection by means of its inherent method, namely by self-contemplation. The whole action is identical in kind with that which produces the cosmos, and is now repeated in miniature for the particular world of the individual. Only we must remember that this miniature reproduction of the creative process is based upon the great fundamental principles inherent in the universal mind, and cannot be disassociated from them without involving a conception of the individual which will ultimately be found self-destructive because it cuts away the foundation on which his individuality rests. It will therefore be seen that any individuality based upon the fundamental standard of personality thus involved in the universal mind has reached the basic principle of union with the originating spirit itself. And we are therefore correct in saying that union is attained through, or by means of, this standard personality. This is a great truth which in all ages has been set forth under a variety of symbolic statements, often misunderstood, and still continuing to be so, owing to the inherent vitality of the idea itself, even a partial apprehension of it produces a corresponding measure of good results. This falling short has been occasioned by the failure to recognize an eternal principle at the back of the particular statements. In a word, the failure to see what they are talking about. All principles are eternal in themselves, and this is what distinguishes them from their particular manifestations as laws determined by temporary and local conditions. If, then, we would reach the root of the matter, we must penetrate through all verbal statements to an eternal principle, which is as active now as ever in the past and which is available to ourselves as to any who have gone before us. Therefore, it is that when we discern an eternal and universal principle of human personality, as necessarily involved in the essential being of the originating universal spirit, Phileus in Grameo Patris, we have discovered the true normal standard of personality. Then, because this standard is nothing else than the principle of personality expanded to infinitude, there is no limit to the expansion which we ourselves may attain by the operation in us of these principles, and so we are never placed in a position of antagonism to the true law of our being. But on the contrary, the larger and more fundamental our conception of personal development, the greater will be the fulfillment which we give to the law, the normal standard of personality, is found to be itself the law of the creative process, working at the personal level. And it cannot be subject to limitation for the simple reason that the process being that of the self-contemplation of spirit, no limits can possibly be assigned to this contemplation. We need, therefore, never be afraid of forming too high an idea of human possibilities, provided always that we take this standard as a foundation on which to build up the edifice of our personality. And we see that this standard is no arbitrary one, but simply the expression and personality of the one all-embracing spirit of the affirmative, and therefore the only limitation implied by conformity to it is that of being prevented by running on lines the opposite of those of the creative process. That is to say, from calling into action causes of disintegration and destruction. In the truly constructive order, therefore, the divine standard of personality is as really the basis of the development of specific personality as the universal mind is the necessary basis of generic mentality. And just as without this generic ultimate of mind, we should none of us see the same world at the same time. 
and in fact have no consciousness of existence. So apart from this divine standard of personality, it is equally impossible for us to specialize the generic law of our being so as to develop all the glorious possibilities that are latent in it. Only we must never forget the difference between these two statements of the universal law. The one is cosmic and generic, common to the whole race, whether they know it or not, a standard to which we all conform automatically by the mere fact of being human beings, while the other is a personal and individual standard, automatic conformity to which is impossible because that would imply the loss of those powers of initiative and selection which are the very essence of personality. So that this standard necessarily implies a personal selection of it in preference to other conceptions of an antagonistic nature.